If you're here at the New Parish Church of the Brethren, you're at the right place. I'd like to welcome you today to our church service. And if you're blessed by the best, say amen. 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 I have some announcements, and if you have an announcement, please come forward. 1015 Coffee Kitchen. Also, 1015 Congregational Choir Practice for Installation Sunday. 1030, we have Sunday School for All Ages. Tuesday, 6 o'clock, Church Board. Wednesday noon, the newsletter submission deadline. 6 o'clock, Youth on Wednesday. 6.30, Adult Bible Study. And Saturday, we have a 9 a.m. Women's Fellowship Sewing Day. Also, we would like to receive some testimonials on why you enjoy attending New Parish Church of the Brethren. The testimonials will go on the church website. Please email yours to the church office or give it to Angie. And also look at your bulletin for some other announcements. Morning. On behalf of Nurture, I have a few announcements. Um, the first is... April 30th, the last Sunday of this month, will be an installation Sunday for Pastor Billy. Um, afterwards, we're going to have a birthday carry-in dinner. So that's the big part that we need your help with because, first off, we need people there to celebrate, okay? Um, secondly, we need food to give to the people. So we need you to bring food <laughs> for your own birthday celebration. Isn't that rude? But that's what we're doing. Um, so it's a regular carry and dinner. The only difference is we'll have the tables set up um, for each month. And as we said earlier, we'll have a trivia game um, to see which uh, birthday month is the best at trivia. And uh, it's going to be a good time. So we just encourage you. There'll be cake and ice cream um, besides the regular food. And we just encourage you to attend this uh, time of fellowship together. Uh, the second announcement is the um, graduation Sunday will be the first Sunday in June. Um, I believe that is June 4th. And um, we know we have three high school graduates, four, sorry, four high school graduates, um, Wyatt Ernsberger, Derek Moles, um, I didn't write this down, so um, Gabe Senders, and then Evan Matthews, and then for college graduates, we have Ben Toole. But if there are any others, please let me know so we don't miss anybody, um, and especially as we have the towels made for them, we want to make sure we don't miss anybody. So please let me know if you know of any other graduates. Um, and then Bible school is coming up on June 10th. Um, and Becky Drake and Sarah Moore will be leading that. Um, and we just want to remind you, it's coming up. Sign-ups, you'll be noticing sign-ups somewhere soon. Um, also, we're going to be collecting cardboard for a craft. Uh, and I want to make sure I don't miss anything here. Um, if you would like to help with that, uh, please talk to Becky Drake or Sarah Moore, um, and they can let you know what capacity um, we need help with as far as whether it's food or whether it's um, teaching or games or whatever, uh, but we'd love to get people on board to help with that as well. That's what I have. Thank you. We will continue worshiping as we listen to the prelude. us bow our heads for prayer. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have this freedom of worship and for the beautiful day that you gave us with the sunshine this morning. I know it's going to rain, but we do need rain for our, our earth. 
just be with Pastor Billy today and help us to have open minds and hearts to what he's going to present through you. In your name we pray, amen. And please stand if you're able for the next hymn. Good morning. If you are using your hymnal, turn to 281. What a day that will be. Wow, that will be a glorious day. I invite the children uh, forward for the children's message, and Sandy, you're up. Can you hear me? Okay. I want to tell you some stories, and I want you to tell me if they're true or false, okay? I had to bring my reference book with me. Okay, there was a little girl who was walking in the woods, and she got lost. And she found a house, and it had a big chair, a medium chair, and a small chair. And that is called... Goldilocks and the Three Bears. True or false? Is that a true story? Okay, what about this little boy who never really wanted to grow up? And he lived in a land where there was all other boys, and they, they were called the Lost Boys. And they never wanted to grow up, and they battled pirates. And they there was one pirate called Captain Hook, and he had lost part of an arm to an alligator. That's why he was called Captain Hook. Is that a true story? Okay, what about, there was a man who stood out in front of a tomb after, three days after his friend had died. And he stood there and he said, come out. True story? 
Okay, there's another story about this man was leading a whole bunch of people, millions, out of a country into another country, and they got to a sea, and the sea parted so they could go across. True story? Okay, let's go back to the other side once. There was um, there were two kids, and they were lost in the woods, and they found this candy house, and they went inside, and there was a mean old witch there. Now, is that a true story? What about the fact that a long time ago, there was a baby born that would grow up to save everybody in the world? Yes. The true stories, the stories about the bear and the Peter Pan and stuff come from this. It is called A Child's Book of Stories, and it is best known and best loved tales around the world, which means they're all made up, right? Like it's got Puss in Boots in here and everything. And... But when you pick up the Bible, every word in that is true, isn't it? Every word. Every miracle. The Red Sea, the manna in the desert. It's just, who do we thank for that? Who do we thank for that, that every word in the Bible is true? Who gave us all those words? God. So we need to remember that. When you're, when you're young, okay, I'll tell you this, kids. I found this book a couple years back at a garage sale. I first read this book when I was 10 years old. Now, I'm not telling you how many years ago that was. But the reason I got it was there's a story in here called A White Cat. You think? But remember when you're reading for fun like this, it's not true. If God didn't say it, didn't create it, didn't do it, it's not true. And you're going to hear a lot of things that aren't true. But just remember who is in charge of everything. And even us. He knew us before we were even born in our mother's womb. He knows when we're going to go be with him. And I'm going to repeat what a day, glorious day that will be. Can we bow our heads, please? Dear Holy Father God, I thank you for these children. I thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy, Lord. We need you to be with us. We need you to guide us, Father. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. Please stand for the next hymn if you are able. If you're using your hymnals, turn to number one, Majesty.
Morning, church. Look at your neighbor and tell them how good they look today. Y'all, you look good. We're glad you're here today. Welcome to those of you watching us online. Welcome to you as well. We're glad you're here. Uh, it's been a good day. Every day we're together to worship, it's a good day. Um, I don't have a lot of, of prayer things that came in today, so I want to do this with you. I want to know one thing that you're thankful for. Children, today, wife, life, the weather, yeah. What else? Worshiping here, I heard something over here. Music, risen Christ, family. Another what? Another Cubs victory, few and far between. Uh, <laughs> okay, health, gotcha. It's all good stuff, right? There's so much. It's just a part of our life that if you think about it, it's blessings from God. He's given them to us. And so as we take time to pray, take some time to really thank God for the things that we may not even think about regularly because they're just so, so much a part of us. Um, just a reminder in, in terms of, of the list, I mean, you see it printed in your, in your bulletin here. Uh, just remember, uh, Nancy, her procedure's coming. Uh, pacemaker is coming. It's in a, a couple weeks now, the 28th of April. Uh, her back surgery, again, scheduled for June the 14th. Um, whatever else God lays on your heart, please, please, please honor him and pray about that. Um, let's take some time and just pray together. Bow your heads. We've been singing this morning, God, about you, about your greatness, about the anticipation we have to be in your presence one day. We've heard about your truth. We've heard about your love. We've shared about how much we see you and how much we're thankful for God, thank you so much for loving us that you allow us to do these things. Thank you for bringing us here this morning, for giving us the opportunity to practice all of the one another's that the Bible tells us about. It's tough to do those when we're not together. Thank you for a place to come that we don't have to be fearful, we don't have to worry. Thank you for a place to come where we can be ourselves. We don't have to hide in any way, we don't have to imitate or, or otherwise try to be someone we're not. Through the years, since Jesus returned to heaven, the church has gathered for the purpose of remembering the good news and being encouraged to be messengers of that good news. 
We're here today, Father, because we received the good news. We're here today because of the work that Jesus has done in our life. Father, there are names uh, printed up and down the page that we pray for regularly. People with difficulties of, of various kinds, some, some health issues, some mobility issues. Um, Father, each and every one of their days are under your care. Help them to remember that you're with them. Help them to feel your presence. We have those that are in various places here in the United States and around the world that are serving as messengers of your word, as, as missionaries in other places and cultures and purposes. Um, Father, bless them for responding to the call that you placed on their life. Father, for communities that are experiencing difficulty, times of fear, times of upheaval, bless them with leaders to calm, to reassure. Uh, we do pray for, for Nancy, for the procedure that's coming. Uh, continue to watch over her, granting her the peace of your presence, giving her strength in each day, the calming of her spirit through the presence of yours. There's any number of things that we brought into the building today, things of life that we might worry about things of life that might weigh us down, things of life that we might be celebrating. Um, Father, all of these we give to you right now so that you can accomplish what needs to be done. As we continue forward this morning, Father, bless us with the presence of your spirit. Speak to us uh, as, we, as we explore your word. But through all that's said and done, we want you and you alone to be the focus of all that's done. For that, we give you thanks today in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I will be reading John 1, 1 through 13. Please stand if you are able for the reading of God's word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or husband's will, but born of God.
Amen. How you start something matters, and it matters a lot. Imagine if you would, you're going to build a house, and you're going to start with the roof. How's it going to work out for you? Probably not so well. I wanted, I wanted a yard shed. We had just built a house in Milford, and I had no place for my lawnmower and my yard stuff. So I wanted a yard shed. My son-in-law came to my rescue. He says, my mom has one. She doesn't want it anymore. All you got to do is haul it away. Sounds great, right? And so we went up and looked at it. Yeah, it looked good. Wonderful. So our, our young adult Bible study took an evening one night, and we drove up to get this yard shed. We didn't take a whole lot with us other than muscle and a couple of straps. We figured we can just pop this thing, roll it onto the flatbed, strap it down, and drive home, right? If it were only that easy. Because what you couldn't see when you're standing inside of the shed was that through the years it had sunk into the ground because there was no foundation. And below the dirt, about 8 to 10 inches was the bottom of the shed. Uh, we had we'd take a wood with us and, and a screw gun, and we put handles. The idea we were all just going to lift and walk. Now it ended up being more of a job than that. How you start something matters. We needed to do a lot more exploring. Imagine the ending of a book or a movie gets told to you before you have the chance to read it or see it. Disappointing, isn't it? Imagine if you would... The first verses of the Bible saying this, in the beginning God created, and so on and so forth. And on day one, God says, let there be birds of the air and fish of the sea. What's going to happen? They're going to struggle having some place to live. Because how things start, beginnings matter. And so we're going to talk over the next couple of weeks about our beginning, our relationship as pastor and congregation. I'm uh, going to give you some insight into me and, and what ministry is about with me, um, let you understand where I'm coming from. I've done this every time I start somewhere new, and as I've worked with young pastors, as I've worked with congregations and tra transitions through the years, I've always given this advice. Take some time at the beginning to make sure you understand each other well. Now, I don't want you to panic because there is stuff in here for you. These next three weeks are not all about me because who I am as your pastor or as a pastor, period, comes from these things that I believe that are really applicable for all of us. I just happen to carry them through into, into vocational ministry. And so as we talk these things through, there's going to be stuff for you to grab hold of, and there's going to be things that I'm hoping are going to, going to challenge you and push you just a little bit. Um, I want to start with this word. This word is one that we don't talk about a whole lot. Um, basically because it confuses a lot of people. Worldview is something that, in its simplest form, just describes how we look at the world around us. It's the lens by which we see everything. It shapes everything that we believe, and it shapes our approach to life. So at the, at the center thing, if you would, imagine your life at a, as a wheel. Your worldview is right in the center with the spokes of that wheel going out to things like money, and family, and job, and politics, um, science, history. What you believe at the very core influences what you believe about all those other things. 
It's something we don't take a whole lot of time to talk about, but it's something that shapes everything about us. And so basically what you're going to hear today, in the strictest of definition, is what's at the center of my worldview. Every worldview that you come up with, you see in the second point there, has to answer three questions. Where did man come from? Where did I come from? Where did you come from? It has to answer that question. It has to answer the question of what's wrong with mankind. What's going on? What's the issue that we're struggling with? Because all of these things that we do and say and experience in life have all come out of problems that we have. I mean, the, the inventions that, that people come up with all start with the problem to be solved. The whole purpose of Jesus coming to the earth to live, die, raise again was to deal with the problem of sin. If man isn't sinful, we don't need a savior. And so everything starts with that. And then finally, the, the third question is, what's the solution to the problem? And so as you think about these things, you have to be able to answer those three questions. Now, if you're going to call yourself Christian, if you're going to call yourself a follower of Jesus, then you are putting Jesus at the center. You are required to have Jesus at the center of your worldview if you're going to carry either one of those titles. How many of you consider yourself Christian? Some of you are either unsure or your arms are sore. How many of you consider yourself a follower of Jesus? Okay. If Jesus isn't at the center of your worldview, you're going to have some struggles in life. The passage that Katie read to us was full of really good stuff about why Jesus should be at the center. We're going to recap just a few of the phrases that, that she read to us. Verse number two, we heard these words. He was with God in the beginning which talks about his presence. Verse 3, through him all things were made, his greatness. In him was life and light, his purpose. John came as a witness, our relationship to him. He was in the world, he understood us. Those who receive, believe, became. You receive him, believe in his name, become children of God. We've seen his glory. We circle clear back now to his greatness. Now, if you keep reading through this first chapter of John, because there's a lot of good stuff in this first chapter of John, these come up. In verse 15, he who came after me and surpassed me because he was before me. He came after I came, but because of who he was, he became more. Verse 16, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. All these good things that we have, all these things that we're thankful for is because of him. I'm the voice calling from the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord, shows up in verse 23. Again, it's our relationship to Jesus. We are the messengers. We are his ambassadors. We are the voice. Verse 29, look, the Lamb of God, his relationship to God. And again, it's a repeat in verse 36. Look, the Lamb of God. And when the disciples heard John say this, they followed him. Jesus, when he took over the world, did it in a very unassuming way. And he wasn't even there to take over the world. But think about how much changes just because of the presence of Jesus. So much so, just I just think the very obvious one, we order time around the person of Jesus. Before Christ, we use what? B.C. After Christ, we use A.D., the year of the Lord. Jesus marked all of history just by being here. He marked all of time just by being here. Now, a disciple... Again, just a simple definition. This is a student, an adherent to, a follower of, a very specific, a very specific teacher or thought. 
With that definition in mind, listen to what Jesus tells us in Matthew 28. You know this passage well. We're going to pick it up in verse 18. Jesus came to them and he said these words. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and so therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Go make disciples of all nations. He didn't say disciples of what, did he? Jesus is assuming because he's talking to his disciples that they're going to make disciples of him as well. Here's where we come up short with that sometime. Think about all of your faith training, all of your religious training. And toss it between your hands like this. How much of it was to learn the Bible so that you had the Bible in your head so that you could concentrate and learn and respond to everything life gave to you? And how much of, how much of it was about the person in the life of Jesus so that you could imitate him and be a messenger of him as you went through life? Historically, you know what's happened in the church? It's been this. We are really, really Bible heavy, which isn't a bad thing. Please don't get me wrong. The Bible's a good thing. But here's the rub. Knowing the Bible doesn't make you a disciple, which is why churches end up the way churches end up. What we end up doing is we make disciples of ourselves rather than disciples of Jesus. Why does the church... I'm not, fail is the only word that comes to mind, and I'm not sure it's a failure. Why does the church struggle so much in the public eye? Why does the church struggle to get a reasonable hearing? Why does the church struggle to not be laughed at? Why does the church struggle to not be found irrelevant? It's because we've made disciples of ourselves. And to the church that's formed in the pastor's image or the church that's formed in the founding family's images, the church that's found in the denominational image, all those churches are going to struggle. But the church that says, yes, we celebrate this, we celebrate our, and, and again, heritage is important. Knowing who you are and where you came from, that's important. But at some point, it has to be placed secondary to saying, we are the church that's committed in everything that we say and do and are to being like Jesus. These are the churches that are going to make a difference in the world around us. And it's tough sometimes going from here to here. I can remember growing up, um, my, my dad was deacon in the church. And one of, one of the jobs that he took very seriously was, was preparation for, for a love feast. Um, he and another couple people would, would go and do it, and he would take uh, me and my siblings along if we wanted to go to help because he wanted to teach us what, what communion was all about. Now, in this day and age, here's what communion was about. It was in the basement of our church, and the tables were set up in nice long lines, okay? And we rolled out the white table covering over top. No exaggeration. They measured there was a ruler, and the paper had to be so far on each side. And they worked and worked and worked until that was perfectly adjusted, okay? Straight up the middle of the table, in order, had to be water, flour, bread, cup. Flour, 
water, bread, cup. It had to be in order. And if you stood at the end, you had to be able to look down the table and not see any of this. Okay? The plates in front of each chair, just so, and the napkins folded just so. And then the chairs were put in, and again, the chairs, you had to look down now and make sure they were all pushed in exactly the same. Because communion couldn't happen if the room didn't look right. Now, through God's grace, they shifted their thinking and they changed and they morphed through the years. Um, but it was a lot of years that that was the standard for what communion was. Forgetting about the whole message of communion. Think about what the message of communion is. Think about what we celebrate. This is my body broken for you, a sinner who's imperfect. And we're trying to achieve perfection for a meal that's about imperfection. We're trying to make everything rigid for a cup of blessing that was spilled for you that offers grace in the imperfection. We missed the mark when we were teaching communion back in those days. But churches do that. I just, just replayed the things that you still believe to be true about your faith. And here's where I want to give you the first challenge of the day. How much of it is Jesus-based and how much of it is church-based? The ones that aren't Jesus-based and the ones that you can't take back to Jesus, I really want you to consider setting them aside and not worrying about them anymore. Okay? Because if Jesus is the center of your worldview, the things that he's not in the center of don't matter. So when we talk about making disciples, when Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, he wanted imitators of him. He wanted people that were going to follow him. And so to be a disciple of Jesus means that someone is hearing about him, they're hearing from him, and they're striving to be like him and ordering their life around him. The simple question is, is that you? Can you look at that and say, I'm doing those four things? If you can, blessings on you. You're a, you are a disciple of Jesus. If you can't, blessings on you because you're somebody who's willing to grow to become like Jesus and you'll explore those things. So why have I walked you through all of that stuff? It's to get to this. This is the key for today. And this is where my ministry starts. This is the beginning of what I do. A disciple of Jesus is always going to be a Christian. But a Christian is not always going to be a disciple of Jesus. Did you know that the early church weren't the ones that coined the phrase Christian? There is a time, we read about it in the book of Acts, that Barnabas brings Paul to Antioch. And they're spending some time there ministering and working and, and developing the, the, the faith of the people in the church of Antioch. And the people of the community are looking and they're seeing what's going on. And they're so excited and so pleased with the impact that the church is making and they've heard the teaching and the preaching of what's being shared, they coined the term Christian. They coined the term that said, these people are so like this person of Christ that they talk about, they must be Christian. Can people just look at you and just listen to you and know without question you're Christian? Is it that obvious 
that that's the first word that comes to mind. With me, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. There's, there's times that I, you know, in all honesty, I, I take the name and I just, I boot, I boot it bad sometimes. Um, and I'm thankful for God's grace when that happens. But could people know, the people that know you and see you regularly, do they know that Christ is at the center of who you are? Do they know he's at the center of all that you think and all you believe? There's a lot of things that through the years in ministry I've talked about with people. Just about every topic that you can imagine. And when you talk with people about those things, you get a real good sense about what it is that they believe. And it's scary sometimes. We had, we had folks in, in our one congregation who, as our girls were growing up and dating, wondered why they weren't living with their boyfriends before they got married. They wanted to, well, why don't they want to know if it's going to work or not? These are people that call themselves Christian. These are people that would go to the wall that the Bible says this about any number of things. But they couldn't understand why a couple wouldn't live together prior to being married. You know the difficult thing about saying you believe the Bible? Is that you've got to believe the whole thing, even when it's uncomfortable. A disciple is always a Christian, but a Christian is not always a disciple. I'm pondering if I want to share this or not, excuse me. We're going to move on. So with all of that in mind, when I do ministry, here's how it goes. I'm what's called Christocentric. Christocentric, Christ at the center. And so when I read the Bible, when I study the Bible, when I look at the Bible, I do it in that order. I always start with Jesus and the Gospels. Even if I'm preaching, um, well, I'll, I'll do this one. We'll give you this preview. Uh, Ten Commandments. I'm going to preach the Ten Commandments. That's going to be coming up here shortly. We're going to walk our way through the, the, the Ten. Very rarely do I preach out of the Old Testament to do it. Why? For this simple reason. What did Jesus say when he was asked about the law and what his purpose was? I came not to change any of it. Not the slightest jot or tittle. I came to perfect it. And so if God gave these Ten Commandments and he gave them in this form where the law was, was the thing, and Jesus said, I came to perfect this, they're still the same, but look at them now through my life. Doesn't it make sense to look at them through his life? Um, so I always start with Jesus and the Gospels. I go then to the rest of the New Testament letters. How did the first century church respond to Jesus? Because they're the ones most closely related to Jesus. They were there. This is the very first generation of believers. They have the greatest insight. They have the greatest connection. After I finish that, I go to the pastoral letters. As we're calling up leaders into the church, what do we need our leaders to do in order to continue this message? And then and only then do I bounce back and see how does all of this New Testament covenant stuff fulfill and perfect the Old Testament covenant stuff? 
You know what the beauty of the scriptures are? They work hand in hand. If you take your time to really work through them, you're always going to see that they're connected. The entire word of God, inspired, true, complete, authentic, I believe it. But I also believe there's a hierarchy to scripture. And the hierarchy is based on who's at the center of my worldview. If Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, then I need to read things through that lens if I truly believe it. Now, why do churches believe different things about different topics? It's because they don't start and study in that same order. Is any of it right, wrong, different? I think it's all just different. I have, I have great friends that are uh, Pentecostal, charismatic. They start their study in the book of Acts. They want to see how the Holy Spirit worked. How did the Holy Spirit express the things that Jesus taught? Okay, that's fine too. The Spirit of God is still the Spirit of God. But what happens is this, the places that they land compared to the places I land can place to somewhere where a fundamentalist will land. The things that are essential and really matter are the same regardless of where we started. The expressions of them are what's different. We waste an awful lot of time of the things that aren't the essentials of our faith. And that's what Paul tackles a lot in the New Testament letters. He says, you know what, you've heard these things. He writes the words, I want you to crave pure spiritual milk. He says, I want you to crave these things that are going to feed you, that are going to mature you. The writer of Hebrews says, yeah, this is great, it was wonderful, but where you, you never graduated to meet. I mean, those of us who look like me, we're adults, we have big bodies, we move, we're active. We cannot live on baby formula, right? Guys, could you imagine going home and Similac is your lunch today? It's not gonna satisfy, is it? We need more nourishment in order to keep growing. Our babies, they stay on formula for a while, and then we get them into the baby, baby food. And be honest, mom and dad, you all taste it. You all know what it tastes like. I was a Tutti Frutti fan growing up. They graduate then to people food. And then they become their own walking, thinking, breathing person that says, yes, I would like nuggets for lunch, please, but they have to be Dino shaped. In fact, the Dino nuggets are better. Think about it. Try it, you'll know. Um, but the same thing happens with our faith. This pure spiritual milk is what we're fed when we first come to Christ. It's these things that we're fed when we're first learning how to think and understand life through a lens that wasn't a part of us prior to believing in Jesus. And we have to graduate slowly. Nothing scares me more than the new believer that says this. I started reading my Bible in Genesis. I'm up to Leviticus so far. I don't know that I can do this anymore. Well, of course you can't. You don't need to be reading there yet. Let's start you here. The new believer that says, I just read Revelation. None of it made sense to me. None of it makes sense to me either. I don't know that it's supposed to make sense to us. Let's start here instead. Jesus at the center. I start with Jesus. I start with the Gospels. I go to how people talk and taught about him. Now, a lot of this, just a dump, a lot of it really not all that interesting. 
But this is one of the few times you're going to hear me make a promise to you. And I'm going to put them in writing so you can hold me to them, okay? I promise you these things. At some point in my ministry here, because of my beginnings, because of how I view everything, I'm going to make you all mad at some point in time. Some of you I probably already have. I'm going to offend all of you at some point in time. I'm going to disappoint all of you at some point in time. You have my word, those three things are going to happen. You've also got my word that never when it does happen has it been intentional or personal. But this is what we know about the gospel. We know by reading the words of Jesus. We know by reading the words of Paul. We know by just simply the experience of the gospel. You know what happens when you start talking about Jesus? I can remember I was, I was sitting on an airplane once heading to um, Atlanta. I was going to an Orange Conference in Atlanta. And the person beside me is one of those that likes to make small talk on a plane. I'm not that kind of person. I like the plane ride to myself, but this person wanted to talk. And it was all well and good until this question. What do you do for a living? Well, I'm a pastor. Oh. Their whole countenance changes. Their whole means of expressing themselves changes. Well, what kind of pastor are you? Are you, you know, are you, are you a priest? Are you one of those, those preachers? Are you, you know, are you one of these guys that do the new age stuff? What kind of pastor are you? Well, I'm a, I'm a Protestant pastor. Uh, I'm part of a, of a conservative evangelical church that uh, follows Jesus. And it was all well and good until you mentioned the name of Jesus. He was okay even with me being pastor until Jesus came into the picture. His whole countenance changed again. And, yeah, there was no doubt of no doubt in my mind by the time we finished the ride what he, what he thought about Jesus and the church. But pay attention in life. People are so willing to talk about God because God is this big nebulous thing in most people's minds. They think that God of our faith is the God of Islamic faith, is the God of Hindi faith is the God of Buddhist faith. It's an interchangeable name. Jesus is the troublemaker, though. So we know that. Jesus says there's a cost. How do you start to build a tower without considering the cost? You make sure you have enough to complete the job. There's a cost of following me. You need to lay these things down, pick up my cross. You need to follow me. I'm going to set brother against brother, father against son, sister or mother. The gospel fractures. The gospel offends, we read. And so any ministry that puts Jesus at the center at some point is going to accomplish these three things. And you know where it's going to accomplish those things? At that point in time where I challenge you on something that maybe is a thought or a belief that you've developed or didn't develop with Jesus at the center. And that's why it's not personal. That's why it's not intentional. It's just where we've come to life to that thought. My whole purpose as your pastor is this. I want to see you grow. I want to see you get off of pure spiritual milk. I want you to get into the barbecue brisket of faith. Yeah. I want to see you enjoying those big decadent desserts of faith. I want you to have the full meal because, boy, the meals that are coming for us in heaven are incredible. But that's my job. 
is to help you to grow, to help you mature, to help you transform. We're going to talk about transformation next week. Jesus is the center here. Next week, we're going to talk about why transformation is at the center as well. But that's the whole purpose. That's why we come together. That's why we study together. That's why we do the things that we're called to do as a body. And so those things take place. So those are my promises to you. That's probably the only promises you'll ever hear from me. Whoops, I double-clicked. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these now. These, are, these next nine things, there's three slides with three on each. They're going to show up on the Facebook page this afternoon, so you can look at them. You can take some time and read through all of the Scripture passages, okay? Um, Jesus knows these things, that if we follow him, if we put him at the center of our life, if he is both our Lord and our Savior, he knows these nine things will take place for us. And these are all things that help us to grow, mature, and transform. Jesus knew that our faith changes the way we view life when he's at the center. I'm not going to read all nine to you, but you'll get the idea. Jesus knows the value of a relationship with him. You know what? Jesus never asked people to just be Savior. He asked for the entirety of their life. He wanted people to follow him as Lord. So many times we follow Jesus just so we don't burn in hell for all of eternity, which is a good place to start. But boy, you miss out on a lot of good stuff. So Jesus knows these things. Um, Number five, without correct faith, we tend to look for the wrong things. Um, my goal, my hope as I, as I lead is to get you focused on how to look at the right things, the things that are going to make a difference. I want to get to know each other well enough that I can say, hey, have you ever considered looking at this? And on the last, on the last one... Um, Seven is, is one that I want to land on. Growing in faith is largely a question of how much we're willing to discipline ourselves. Basically, it means this. How much are you willing to say, yes, I'll put Jesus at the center. Let's see what happens. Growing in your faith is a question of how willing are you to walk that walk because it's not an easy walk. Are you willing to do it? So, the beginning, beginnings matter. Jesus is the center of my worldview. Everything that I do and say and believe as a pastor and as a person of Jesus comes from Jesus being at the center of everything that I say and do. So everything that you're going, every decision I make, every question I ask about the congregation or about you is going to come from Jesus at the center. It's going to start with something he said or taught. And so I want you to understand that. That's where everything comes from. What do I want you to do with it today? I want you to do these couple of things. Again, those nine statements are going to show up on the Facebook page. I want you to take time this week. I want you to read them. I want you to study them with, with the verses. I want you to take time to meditate on them. They'll be up this afternoon. At the bottom of the page with those uh, statements, you're going to see a link to a website called gotquestions.org. And on that site, I want you to look for an article. And the link will take you there. It's going to take you to an article, The Difference Between a Christian and a Disciple. I'd like for you to take some time with that article, um, read it, digest it. There's some scriptures for you to read and some thoughts for you to, to think about. Now, for those of you that don't have access, if you don't have Internet access to it, if you absolutely can't get online to do it, there's like a dozen or so paper copies on the bulletin table back here. If you absolutely need one of those because you can't do it online, take one of those, okay? But if you can do it online, uh, save those for the others if you would. 
Uh, but all that will show up on, on one post on the Facebook today. I want you to take time this week and chew on those things. Uh, and then the, the third item there, if you haven't done so already, I want you to take some time to start exploring your worldview. I want you to get serious about asking yourself, what is it that really, really drives me? Um, one, of the, one of the big big struggles with the church over the last couple of years. And again, this may be one of those I promise to anger or offend you. This may be one of those things. Um, the church over the last couple of years, there's been this great, rapid, and dangerous rise of Christian nationalism where we're putting America at the center of our faith. And it's a dangerous way to live. There's a lot of stuff in Scripture that would cause people believing that uh, to question themselves if they would take the time to put all the pieces together. But there are, there are clarion calls being made. There are, there are things being said. There are expressions being made outside into the world that honestly the church need to be ashamed of for saying and behaving the way that she's been behaving. And so that, that's what all this stuff is about. Um, so as you put your worldview together, um, really be honest with yourself about what I believe about these things. Um, I'll just leave it at that. That's too big of a rapid trail. Um, yeah. Just, I'm going to stop. We'll pick up. We'll pick up the rest of it starting next week. Uh, next week, my favorite things. We all have favorites. Um, my favorite thing in terms of ministry in the beginning, putting Jesus at the center. I think the churches that succeed are the ones that start there. I see a lot of that here already. Um, we're just going to make sure it's completely smooth and polished all the way around every edge. Let's pray together. God, thank you for giving us your son, for sending him this world so that we would have an example to follow. Thank you for sending him to this world so that we would have a leader as well as a savior. It's not easy to order our life around just one singular thought. But wonderful things happen when we do. My prayer for all of us is that we would take time this week just to re-examine how strong of a role Jesus plays. We so often call him Savior and Lord. And a lot of times we're pretty successful living that way. For the times that we come up short, Father, thank you for your grace. Challenge us this week with both what we believe and what we say we believe. May Jesus be first in our thoughts, on our mind, in our speech, in our actions. So that all the world can see and say, yes, there's some of those Christians. In the name of Christ, we get to pray today. Amen. I thought it was a great, yeah, this is my father's world. It goes simply like this. It all belongs to God already. We're a part of it. We're blessed to walk in it. We're blessed to do it because of the work that Jesus did. So as you sing it, um, sing it through the understanding that Jesus makes it possible 
where you can enjoy it as the lyrics say. Okay? All yours. The one whose body broke for you, the one whose blood shed for you, was with God at the beginning of the creation of this world, and he walks with you today. Leave today walking in his presence, in his love, in his grace, in his mercy. Embrace it as yours because it was given for you. In his name we go. Amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you.